circles, whatever the circle is, everybody needs a circle. And that's how you navigate through what's coming in 2022, no matter what. I know I have people that I can lean on for support. So that is half the battle. When you feel that you're alone in anything, you're done. Perspective is everything. And if your perspective tells you that you cannot do it, you're done, you're done. But if your influence tells you you can, you're ready. That's Sandra Jo Galvan, the superintendent of the Greenfield Union School District, joining me this week on the podcast. She's passionate about preparing students to be social, emotionally, and academically prepared for college and career. And she ensures that every member of her community knows that they're an elite team member dedicated to the task of saving students from the cycle of poverty. Sandra shares with us how her own experiences growing up shaped the values that she has today as a leader and why she believes in the power of social networks and people. How do you navigate change? It's a question we think about often and one that today's world expects us to be comfortable with. The challenge, however, is where do you begin and how do you develop the mindset and skills to be successful? You're listening to Designing Schools, And I'm your host, Dr. Saba Kidwai, educator, researcher, and storyteller. Join me each week for stories and strategies that bridge the gap between research and practice as together we explore how might we design schools. I know I started this as a joke, but like literally, how are you such a superwoman? And I'm asking that in a joking way, but at the same time, I'm also thinking about all the different things that superintendents are balancing and just the different things we're hearing in the news, yet you constantly show up with this energy and enthusiasm. Where does it come from for you? Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for that compliment because we like we live through our own lens and so we never really know how we project things, but like I have a fabulous family, like my brothers, I'm the baby of six. So that probably he had to run around like figuring out life by myself as a, as the youngest. And there's nine years between me and all them. Like they all grew up together. And then here's this baby that came around, you know? And so that like gave me a lot of confidence and then really just a wonderful, like we have fun, you know, family times and we laugh. And so the energy I think just comes from outlook on life, a lot of positivity, rolling with the punches kind of a thing. And when things happen, like, okay, the, why is this happening to me? Like, how can I persevere through it so I can make sure that I learn from this lesson and everything is temporary. It's just a, a life philosophy that like everything's temporary. You know, I might've got knocked down today, but tomorrow I'm going to be at the high, like the top of the mountain. So just objective, like confidence and those kinds of things that I got a lot when I was growing up being the baby of six, but then also just in the circles of people that I'm around that are just super positive lights and sunshine. Do you think that's, is that something that you always had like since the beginning, or is that something you feel like you went through an experience or something that really helped you shift to develop that mindset? I think I've just, oh, I'm wired like that. I really do. Like nothing. I know it's crazy because people will say like, "Well, well, how did you get to do that? Like, I don't know. It's just it's kind of like just biology. I think just the way we're wired to do, like I'm a big energy person and I'm attracted to that. Like when people come at me as well, I would say this though, I see the results of that energy and I see the feedback and I see the vibe I get. So I love to present, I love to consult and I love to deliver content of whatever sort in professional settings with teachers. And I get as much as I give. So it's also that return on investment. So because I've had success going through life, feeling that, I want to repeat it. I want to repeat it in extra cycles. And I will give a tribute to my big sister, who is 16 years older than me. She's the oldest. I'm the youngest. She was a kindergarten teacher when I was in fifth grade. I was a 10-year-old and she was taught kindergarten. And I went into her classroom during lunch and she said, hey, why don't you come like read some stories to the kids? I'm like, no, I'm going to go hang out with my friends. She's like, no, 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 come on. Let me just show you what this is all about. I'm like, okay, let's go. So I went, I read a story and it was like, oh my gosh, I had a captivating audience of five-year-olds, 35-year-olds. I was 10, double their age, reading them a story and they were like putty in my hands. Like I was animated in performance and reading and they brought life to it. And so that at a very early age, I felt like, wow, the power of relationships, the power of just presence, the power of animations and big energy. 
gave me positive reinforcement. And so perhaps that was it. Maybe you just pulled that out of me. I don't know. You're quite good. (laughs) Why are we the way we are? It's a question I love thinking about when it comes to myself. And it's what makes me incredibly curious when I meet others. Ever since I began following Zandra, I've been in awe of her energy. And after a little digging, she shared a transformative experience that she had at 10 years old that gave her insight into what energizes her, teaching others and the relationships that that cultivates. The results of the energy she felt at 10 years old carried her through her career, where you'll see a resounding theme of this interview is the power of relationships. Why? Because time and time again, she's felt the return of energy from making an investment in the one thing we often neglect, people. At a time where so many students feel lost and find school to be irrelevant, Zandra's story really is a reminder about the power of discovering purpose at an early age. Stanford researcher William Damon, an education professor and director of the Stanford Center on Adolescence, says that there are two key beliefs that are important for young people in finding purpose. First, a realization that there is a need in the world that calls for action. And second, believing you are capable of making an impact. Purpose, he says, is the preeminent long-term motivator of learning and achievement. Schools that encourage purpose will see their students become energized, diligent, and resilient in the face of challenges and obstacles. As you hear Zandra's story, you'll see how understanding her purpose at an early age led her to resiliency in the face of challenges. So let's keep digging. I asked Sandra how she went from reading to five-year-olds to leading a district as a superintendent through one of the most trying times, a global pandemic. Hmm. Okay. So one I recently reflected on and not necessarily did I know. It's kind of like sometimes later in life you discover what happened. And as a result of that, you want to change the trajectory of others in the future. So one thing in particular is I went to high school in the neighboring town. So I happened to be the superintendent of the district that I went to school in. So I'm super proud of that. But we didn't have a high school at the time. So I got bus to the neighboring town down the highway, about 10 miles down the road to go to high school over there. And so when I went to high school, I didn't realize that there were the haves and there were the have nots because I was always with the haves. So I was... ASB president of the school, you know, uh, did all the homecoming queen types of things. I did all sports. I played all sports. I got really good grades, but I didn't realize that there wasn't all the things that were afforded to me as a young female of color. And I, I said, well, my goodness, this doesn't make sense to me. At the time, I didn't know. So I went to junior college. I didn't go to like a four-year university where my friends did from a different town, right? And so then as I was speaking to my adult friends that we went to high school together and we were just talking and I said, oh my God, like you went to like this prestigious university out of high school? How did that happen? Like, wow, good for you. I didn't even think I could do that. It's like, what? Like the counselor didn't take you to the colleges? I'm like, no, they took you? Yeah, they did. Like, oh my God, like, are you kidding me? They took you, but they didn't take me. And I had all of these X, Y, Z things stacked in my favor, but the color of my skin was predetermining whether I was going to be afforded an opportunity to visit a university. So then I realized that there were gatekeepers in the world, gatekeepers that didn't necessarily allow all students to prosper and all students to succeed. And so for me, it was about zip codes, like a zip code should never, ever predetermine the future of a child. There aspirations, their motivation, their skill, all of that should predetermine where they are. And so for me, I do everything possible to make sure that history doesn't repeat itself, that every one of my counselors and those that I interact with, that they give it their 110% and go the extra mile for kids to make sure that that isn't repeated. So that's one instance of like, whoa, that was a pivotal moment in my mind. Like I knew I was doing because it was the right thing to do to help support kids and advance them in life because I wanted them to succeed. But it even multiplied when I realized, whoa, like I was a recipient of some gatekeeper tragedy. It all worked out. Like I'm I'm totally happy with where I'm at, but it just goes to show you had I not, what would my future have looked like? Would it have been different? 
We're just beginning the conversation, yet I admire how reflective Xandra is about her own experiences and how she's changing the narrative as a leader in her community. She reflects on a powerful question, how might my future have looked different? There's not a day that goes by where I don't think about a quote from William Gibson. The future is here. It just isn't evenly distributed. I believe one of the greatest responsibilities we have in education is being informed about trends, both current and future, so that we're creating exposure and access for young people in our schools. I often share how after reading Thomas Friedman's Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist's Guide to Thriving in the Age of Acceleration, I realized that not everyone had struggled during the Great Recession. In fact, many people thrived. The difference? Exposure and access to the opportunities in the world an understanding of your strengths, and what energizes you. These are the questions that too many of us begin exploring after graduation instead of before. Shifting this dynamic is probably one of the most important tasks upon us because schools are really in a position to be able to create a more equitable balance where students, where everybody has more access and exposure to the opportunities that the world offers. Another pivotal one is just kids. Like kids make my heart melt. And so being a teacher, being a coach and being able to influence in the classroom and talking to kids, like talking to them and really like understanding what they want their future to be like is pivotal for me. And so I always want, I'm always grounded in that teacher aspiration. So from becoming a teacher to then moving into administration, always talking to kids and getting their perspective and their voice because I can't make decisions about anyone without having that relationship with children to know that what I do matters to their future and anything I bring in matters to their future. And then when I engage their parents in a conversation on the street, that matters to their future. And so I realized quickly that experiences shape the future of children. And if you don't aren't afforded certain experiences, you're not able to experience that, therefore you don't know it even exists. And so intentionality when it comes to my positionality as a superintendent, as a teacher, as an administrator, as a coach, whatever that was, was always grounded in how do I make sure that I'm doing optimal, giving experiential knowledge to students and scholars all around me so that that is getting them closer to whatever their hopes and dreams are. And so that was pivotal for me and really just reflecting on my position, no matter what that was. The theme for this season's podcast was transformational leadership. We use the definition from Peter Nordhaus, who says it's built on four pillars, building trust, encouraging creativity, recognizing accomplishments, and inspiring a collective vision. When asked about how they do this, every leader on the podcast said one word, relationships. They didn't just say the word, they've shared some incredible strategies and stories about how they've done this and the impact it's had. This past week, I had the privilege of presenting at the CIS Leadership Symposium organized by the Monterey County Office of Education. The theme of the conference was liberate our voice and our time. While many are talking about transformation in schools, many are also fearful about the burnout and stress that people are experiencing. In my session, Designing Schools from Trust to Transformation, I shared how one of the best ways to overcome this culture is by investing and nurturing relationships. Transformational leaders have specific strategies and frameworks to design the conversations they're having with their community about change. They recognize the importance of scaffolding the conversation so that we move from ideas about change to seeing real impact. I'm leading this session again on March 10th. This time I'm doing it virtually. To learn more, I'll share a link in the show notes. But I asked Sandra to share, how has she built these relationships with her faculty and staff? Oh my goodness, like that is everything. Like relationships, human connection, leaning in, emotional intelligence, like being able to feel that vibe with another person is really where it's all about. So this is my, I'm just finishing my fifth year as a superintendent of this district and mid-year point. And what 
has transcended over the last five years, started all with relationships. People don't care until, you know, you demonstrate to them that you care about them. Like they weren't, they're not going to do it. And people will go the extra mile for people that they know that appreciate them. That is natural for me. Like naturally when I interact with someone, I love them first. I love them first. And I know that they have, I assume positive intentions and that they got into teaching, they got into their career, they got into whatever that was because there was something in them that they just loved about whatever that is. Like if it's kids, if it's business world, whatever that is, there's a core value and a passion driven behind their life, right? And so I entered the conversation from that place and just wanting to know and to be better at what I do. So that's kind of the context about like, what is it that makes me kind of drive and what is it that I want to do with students when I go into classrooms and like influence in that sense? Do you have any particular strategies you would share for and somebody maybe who was struggling to build that trust or, you know, you talk even just about appreciation, like how you give out that appreciation. Would you have any like strategies that like these certain things have worked really well for us and maybe could for somebody else too? Absolutely. So number one is like really asking the question, how are you? And, and truly listening to the response. During the pandemic, we had a lot of people in our district that were going through different things. And I would never presume to to even think about or to assume I know anything about their story. Everyone comes to the to a space with a unique experience. And so my first question is, how are you? How are you? Before I ask them, what are the students learning? What's the you know intentionality behind that learning target and the success criteria and all those things that we know that I love with curriculum and instruction, that won't happen if the relationship and the trust and the caring for another person is there. So my ground really just like, my goal, my North Star is really making sure that people feel connected to our community and that we'll do whatever is necessary to make sure that they don't fail. And some people have different aspirations. Some people have different entry points uh, when they come into the conversation, but asking them how they're doing is number one and truly listening to that. Um, Number two, don't be so fast to go to point A, from A to B without stopping and pausing because any conversation has the power to transcend and just shift a person's aspect in life. And then third, just really thinking of the power of words when we communicate with others. I'm big on communication. I'm big on highlighting and celebrating our people. And so another really big thing that I do is I highlight my people on social media. And sometimes my staff's like, again, Sandra? I'm like, yes, again. It's never enough. Because when somebody sees their face or you, I, like I forget my positionality, right? I'm the superintendent. I'm just a person that sends emails in pink font still because that's who I am. Authenticity, right? I'm not going to change it because I got a new title. I'm still using pink font when I send out emails. But with that, it's like, how do I communicate to you that this experience is a unique one? Like, I care about you. You care about me. And how do we work together moving forward? It is so critical. And using the position to help influence the conversations that happen. And so people start, they realize, wow, she's not just the fluff. You know, she's not really just saying that she truly means that. And I can't even tell you enough, like this week coming back after the pandemic and um, really intentionally communicating. And I do videos a lot. I celebrate people a lot because I want them to know and hear my voice and the sincerity behind it. Like, I'm not going to ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. One of my greatest celebrations is labor. Our labor partners and our unions are really great partners with us. And that's intentional. Like when we go out on something or we have a big decision we have to make, I'm going to them first to understand impact. How does that impact you? And they listen and they're ready to come to the table. Why? Because of those one single conversation, the check-ins, the relationships that we've cultivated and developed. And so I can't say that enough about the success of a leader is shown by the efforts and interest of their people in whatever they're doing or the organization. And two compliments I can share with you that I received was from labor. Um, One of them said, you're the first superintendent ever, Zandra. And I've been here over 20 years that I trust, that I would stand behind and I trust. That's huge. And then another compliment, again, from, from one of our negotiators that sit at the table. You know, I was, I was getting ready to quit. I was, you know, I wasn't going to do this anymore. However, I stayed because of the trust that we have between you and our assistant superintendent. 
And I'm like, wow, that is powerful. So that goes to show that they truly, what we're doing on the day-to-day, relationally, listening, inviting perspective, and not unilaterally making decisions is really sought and seen by our membership. And then I get emails, you know, here and there, every once in a while, like, just thank you. Don't ever go. Please stay here because we've never had a superintendent like you that really cares about us. And that just like, wow, like, thank you so much for saying that because people don't realize that superintendents are, we're very lonely in terms of like, uh, there's only one and nobody really gets what we go through. And so to hear someone check on you when we're, our job is to check on everyone, but to have that reciprocated is huge. And so really appreciate that. The success of a leader is shown by the efforts and interest of their people in what they are doing, she says. I love how Zandra also says, celebrate the people around you, not just once, not just twice, but over and over again. She also highlights how incredible it feels to have someone return that empathy and ask her how she's doing. She also shares that leadership is lonely, and one of the places many have found community is on social media. Zandra practices leadership at the intersection of our physical and virtual worlds. And so I asked her to share more about a trending skill that I'm often really interested in, identified by the World Economic Forum as leadership and social influence. And I also asked her how she balances her time in being in both spaces. Completely wow, like mind blowing, honestly. The presence that someone has and how you project and what you value is your brand. And so if anyone went and I teach a a workshop on this and I teach it to superintendents and administrators about leading and communicating through three areas, flair, because you have to add your own flair, your personal flair to it through finessing it, because you want to make sure that it's telling a story and it's really fine-tuned and it's really uh, something that people are noticing that has a value and then frequency. You can't just drop something once on social media and then go away and never come back because then there's not influence. So the frequency is also important and it means different things to different audiences. And so my workshop I do is called communicating and leading with flair, finesse and frequency. And so what does that mean? So to me, it's a little different than anyone else. And it's my kind of my brand in terms of what I value. And so my core values are people, like totally people and celebrating people and helping people do good work. And so what I do is I, every chance I get, I'm capturing a photo of kids or I'm capturing a photo or a video of team members or of administrators or parents or what we're doing or what we're celebrating at the time and sharing that with the world because it highlights who they are. Two things happen. The first thing that happens is you get your message out there when other people will fill in the blanks. If you don't tell your story, someone else will will tell it for you and it will definitely not be accurate. So you get ahead of it, you tell your story. And the second part that happens is the benefit from those who are highlighted is immense in terms of the gratitude and the appreciation that they receive because we appreciate them. And so big with labor, big with parents, big with kids. And then the snippets, like, and they're not long, they're short, but the value of that on social media is definitely something that speaks volumes to celebrating people, which circles back to your relationships and it circles back to the human value and treating everyone with that kindness that they deserve. I love that. That is, yeah. And you, you do such a phenomenal job of that. Tell me how you balance all the different platforms. Is there one that you (laughs) see as being most significant or most impactful or because you're everywhere, like everywhere and and the best of ways too. like you just show up with that same energy everywhere. How do you balance the different platforms? And is there one in particular that you like over another? Oh gosh. And I've been asked this a lot too. And I'm like, first answer is like, I don't know. Like I just wired this way. Could you know people put things through their own lens, right? And that's all we know. So my first answer is I'm not sure, but I would venture to say this. I do have some shortcuts, like things that I do when I balance. And so during work time, like my calendar is my saving grace. So I color code my calendar and the things that I have to do. I make sure that on the Friday before I leave for the weekend, I'm checking what's happening next week. And then I glance at the following week. So I know I mentally start preparing for what's to come. And so then I start mapping out what I'm going to say, what I'm going to do. And if it's a high influence, like a podcast or something that I have to do an assignment, then I'm already kind of thinking through gradually until it occurs. So those kinds of things happen. 
The other thing that I really do to balance is my mornings before work is dedicated to fitness. So while everyone is sleeping, I'm up and I'm bouncing around in the living room, you know, doing my exercise routine because of the endorphins it gives me. Like, I'm not going to even lie to you. I've only had this much coffee today. I know. Like, that's it. So I don't need coffee. I like it. I want it. I don't need it. But I get up like this and the movement and that endorphins that come from it is what powers me through. So crafting out time that works for you. So for me, it works in the morning before because my days are crazy and they go crazy all the way until like 10 at night. Flair, finesse, and frequency. These are the three pillars of communication that Zandra values. As someone who values people, she uses her platforms to capture and amplify what's happening in her community to share it with the world. After listening to Zandra and being fueled by her energy, it won't surprise you to learn that not only is she a superintendent, but she also went back to school this past year to earn her doctorate. I asked Zandra to share why she made this decision and to tell us about her research interests. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. So I've always wanted to get a doctorate. I've always wanted to aspire to the next level. I'm a lifelong learner. I love teaching and learning. I love just dialoguing about content. I love debating content. So that's really powerful. And I, you know, all of that. And so went to school. I have my BA. I have two masters because I, one wasn't enough. I wanted, I had to go get another one, you know? And so then I was, and then I got my administrative credential. And then I said, gosh, I want to get a doctorate. I want to be Dr. Galvan. Actually, it's going to be Zamora Galvan because I told my dad already, you put me through school. So I got to make sure he gets credit for that. It's going to be, it'll be Dr. Zandra Joe. And Joe, by the way, is my dad's name. And that's why the girls are all, our middle names are after my dad. So it'll be Zandra Joe Zamora Galvan um, on that. But just thinking about, I've always wanted to do it and I just never pulled the plug. And so it's just something personal for me as another aspiration to be able to do. Now, second, that's the initial response. The secondary response is influence within our community of professionals. And so having a doctorate and being an author and a consultant after retirement and going in and working with uh, districts is an esteemed title as well. So the other motivation is after this, what's next is also something that is seen with much more prestige. And then third, the university that I picked is quite phenomenal. So I could have chosen any university, right? But I wanted to, I applied to one and that was it, USC Trojan family, uh, because I have so many sister soups and, and brother soups that are already part of the Trojan family and just encouraged me like it is such a connected group of people. And so the sense of belonging, the sense of connectedness, the sense of after this is done, moving into the next phase of our life or the next chapter is going to be that much more fruitful when you're in a network of people that you belong to and that have similar understandings and philosophies about that. And so mine's an emphasis in urban education and poverty and diversity and representation. And so those are my passion subjects. And so having that was my third kind of why. Sandra's right, the USC Trojan community is an incredible one. One of the questions that fueled my own motivation to return to school to get my doctorate was becoming more and more curious about now that I know what I know now in terms of current technology trends, future trends, having such an active presence on social media, what would it be like to be a learner in today's world, actually practicing many of the things that we encourage schools to adopt? So I asked Sandra, what is it like being a learner at school in today's world? Horrible. (laughs) I'll tell you why. Online learning? Oh my gosh. Like I graduated college in like BA in 93. And then my last degree was in 2007. And so it's pre dinosaur like age, right? So not all the online and the discussion boards and all that kind of stuff that doesn't always feel personal. That part was like, no, that's horrible because I love the human interaction. See, that's my thing. And so when we get into the classes on a Zoom call, 
you know, it doesn't replace being in a classroom where we get to stand up and have presence and like walk around and, and socialize. So that's the part that I miss because my program is an online program. However, Zoom is justifiably, you know, it is good. And, and we're still able to do the kinds of interactions in the breakout rooms that we want to do. So in that sense, I think it's, it's okay in terms of the social interaction. It's going to be just fine because I get to still talk to people, which is my, you know, my thing. The thing that's beautiful about it now is I have life experiences to bring. I mean, that's beautiful. When we were young and, and learning and trying to figure out life, I didn't have a lot to offer. I have a lot to offer now because I've had ups and downs and I've had experiences and I've seen a lot and I've done a lot. And so to arrive at, and I just turned 50, oh my gosh, right? Well, no, I'm going to turn 51 now. Turn 50 during the pandemic. I'm going to turn 51 next month. Oh my God, 50 is so much better than 51. But we'll just 51. But when I turned, it's like you reflect on your life and the things that you've done and, and you've experienced so much. And so bringing that age into a program of that nature where you're dialoguing about diversity and poverty and having different perspectives. And I am absolutely unapologetic about taking a position for students who don't have a voice. In fact, it happened during my first semester where I had to take a position that was the correct position as an advocate for students of poverty. And I would take it any day of the week, always, because that's how I'm wired. And so had I not had that experience and understanding students of color and what they bring to the table, and they're absolutely intelligent, but they might not have a lot of money. As a young doctoral student, doctoral student, I wouldn't have as much to offer. And so perspective is huge as a person who's gone through life and has experienced some things. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity. I'm so glad you know, that USC selected me to be part of the program. And I'm honored to be learning with a group of people that have so many different perspectives to offer. I love to lean in and learn. And I also love to learn from people who are doing things right. So like, I'll call people if I notice like, um, Saba, oh my God, I see what you're doing. You're doing some phenomenal things. Like, I want to aspire to do something like that. Like, how did you do it? Like, what are your words of advice? What was successful for you? I love to learn from others and I and I that never stops because that's how we continue to sharpen the sword. Life experiences give you the perspective to advocate for others, she said. It's something that takes deep reflection and one of the many things I've come to deeply appreciate about Zandra during our conversation. As we close, I ask her, what are some of the top challenges that she's thinking about right now and what advice she has for others? I would say, so two things. The first thing would most definitely be balance. Balance is incredible to have. I think I saw a quote somewhere about like work and it said, kind of pretty sad, like if, if you passed away, you know, tomorrow, your office would have a replacement for you within a week or so, but your family would have lasting devastation of your, the loss of you. And so that just puts perspective into balance for, that's right. Like, yeah, why do we give so much to the job that is a job? We love it, absolutely adore it. Like this is like, I think I was made for the superintendency. Like I was born for this, totally. But it is still at the end of the day, a job, right? And it, they have to have somebody at the head. Whereas my family, we need to have that balance. So how do I stay healthy for them? How do we do healthy things together? How do I maintain that balance that I give them? Because they're only going to be 12 once. My twins are nine. My 12-year-old is 12. Guess what? They're only going to be nine once. They're only going to be 12 once. I want to make sure that those years, that when they reflect, mom was present and mom was there and loved on them, you know, and wasn't on her phone and her laptop all the time when they're together, right? <laughs> so that's number one. So that, that's a huge takeaway. And then the second takeaway just really getting through all of this is the relationships and to know that you're not in this alone. The relationships that you cultivate with people and they're all different levels, but having a network of people is so critical. And when I say a network, I say a network of sister soups. I have a sister soup network that I lean in on because only us, only we know what we're going through as a female 
Um, and then several of them are people of color. Also, the weight of the world on our shoulders for those that we represent is grave. And then a fit circle. So I have a fit sister circle, a national that we're part of, that we give each other positive affirmations with accountability structures. Like, are you exercising today? You need to get exercise. I didn't see you post anything today. You better get out there. Just go for a walk. Move naturally. Come on. Just go for a walk. And let's talk on the phone while you walk. Got it. So that is a huge piece of that relationship circle. And then my original, which is my sister circle, who I adore because we grew out of the pandemic. And that sister circle is like a hub of my life that we just drop in text method, um, things that are happening to us. When devastation happens, we drop it in there and we reinforce each other. When celebrations happen, we drop it in there and we celebrate each other. When we post something phenomenal, we all reinforce each other and support each other and celebrate it and repost it, you know, because we want to make sure that we celebrate each other. When award is available, we nominate each other. When somebody's in for an interview, we write the recommendation letter for each other. When someone has an interview, we mock interview them to make sure that they're ready. So those kinds of things is so important. And so circles, whatever the circle is, everybody needs a circle. And that's how you navigate through what's coming in 2022, um, no matter what. I know I have people that I can lean on for support. So that is half the battle. When you feel that you're alone in anything, you're done. Perspective is everything. And if your perspective tells you that you cannot do it, you're done. You're done. But if your influence tells you you can, you're ready. How are you creating a culture where people don't feel alone? How are you bringing balance to your life and your work? How are you celebrating the people that you work with? How are you encouraging creativity, which thrives during times of constraint? How are you building trust with your community? Zandra has given us so much to reflect on. And if you want to answer these questions and explore them further with a community of leaders, I invite you to join me on March 10th for my virtual workshop. We'll examine and practice not only frameworks that you can immediately implement to solve problems, enhance decision-making, and build trust and safety, but I'll also be sharing two really incredible tools, Mural and Butter, that are going to change the way you facilitate conversations with your teams, energizing them instead of leaving them fatigued. You can learn more about my workshop in the show notes, or feel free to send me a message on any of my platforms or via email. It's your turn to join the conversation by sharing what you enjoyed or what questions you have. In a world where time and attention are so valuable, thank you for choosing to listen and for being a part of our Designing Schools community. Leaving a review for the podcast helps others learn about the show, giving them the gift of knowledge and allowing this community to help create access and exposure to ideas and opportunities others may not even know exist.